Hello everybody. We are back on good old Galvin Valley harvesting our massive field number 18. Why won't it let me move my camera? There it is. And now I can move my camera. <laughs> no more complaining. We are on the upper half of the field. We kind of cut the field in half and are taking care of the flatter areas, although we'll start to give our hillside a workout as we get further down the hill. Just trying to continue the harvest. Oh, and it's doing that again. Oh, look at that. Do I need to... This is just some bizarre errors I'm seeing in here. Yeah, I don't see anything readily apparent. Let me pull that off, and okay, there we go. Now I see what's in the tank. Maybe it's always been there. I've just never noticed it before. So there you have it. And once again, I can't move my camera. Anyways, quit belly aching about that. We'll see if. Let's see, I probably just as well follow the combine around so I can pick up whatever it has in it shortly and get him sent on his way. I've been having trouble with horseplay in here, having a terrible time with it. I have to basically be sitting in the cab of the tractor before it will just drop it off in the trigger. Continue to wrestle with Ad. I actually spent in a fair amount of time this evening uh, looking at the course play code. But wow, is Ad a complicated beast. And so I really don't know what to touch in there, what to leave alone. So I think uh, it's going to be the, the la a ladder. I'm going to just leave it alone. And oh I can't just hope that it's gonna start working I know it's it's not gonna do that but I think it's one of those things and it's simply of my pay grade all right let's see if we can fill this thing up and get it going and you know this is one field here where maybe we should be thinking of a larger vehicle all right let me drive course what are you going to do? Neat, 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 neat. Hold, hold, hold the phone. This silly thing. Start course. Alright, now it'll head for the corner. You gotta watch this silly thing. I think with the road coming over here, it gets confused and it wants to drive on it. So... When what we really wanted to do is to head down here to go out of the field. Man, alive, slow down. Ooh, it's going to have trouble making that corner. Well, it'll be a little easier to babysit, I suppose, as I don't have too much else to be doing. As a combine will do its harvesting, I don't have any... Uh, windrowing to do at the moment so maybe I could just park on this as we once again make a loop up the hill and try to get this old. As you can see we are poor, 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 poor farmers always in the hole. Yeah, look out car. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we are 30 grand in the hole but we are slowly working on it. I think the prices let me just check here real quick. I think we continue to have the best returns up here at Pheasant Pluckers. Well, where is it? Somewhere down here we go. Well, now wait a minute. 211. Okay. 123. Maybe I was looking at something else. Oh, for some reason I thought I saw something that would beat that. All right, Pheasant Pluckers it is. We're going to head up the hill. This thing needs to just slow down a fuzz. You know, I am positive this thing worked better 
several uh, episodes ago. I just, I don't know what I might have done to it to cause it to not work the best. Max speed, street speed, from record. I think, well, yeah, I'm gonna have to just monitor it here a little bit. We'll see if we get it to work. But anyway, uh, this particular session, um, I thought back on something in my history, my own personal history, if you will. I'm kind of an old geezer. And I was going to just start this by asking a question. If anybody listening to this lives near or kind of in range of a volcano, um, where I live in the state of Oregon, I live in the Willamette Valley, and kind of in the northwestern part of the state, if you will, which is where the valley is, and north of us may be, oh goodness, is it probably 100 miles, maybe, into the state of Washington. I'm just guessing. Someone could probably tell me I'm all wet. Um, uh, all I know is it takes several hours drive to get there, but it isn't totally as the crow flies, so what I'm thinking is a crow flies distance, it's probably a hundred miles, is a volcano. And, and actually it isn't the closest one, uh, this, this one here in Washington is um, Mount St. Helens. It's actually part of what is called the Ring of Fire. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that term before. It's this ring of volcanoes kind of around the Pacific Ocean. And part of them are on the North American continent, maybe even South America too. I'm not sure if it goes all the way down there. I'm not that, that good with uh, geography or, or geology in this case. <laughs> but I do know there's a number of volcanoes here. You know, we have uh, near our home Mount Hood uh, that's probably, oh shoot, maybe that one's even 100 miles. Uh, it's got to be closer than Mount St. Helens. It's, yeah, it's definitely closer. Come on, tractor. It just does not. Turns me to see six miles an hour on my foot. Anyways, up north, and, and I think there's a couple others in 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 Oregon as well, uh, in the Cascade Range, they say they are quote, dormant. You know, what does that mean? But if you look into the history of some of these mountains, you know, they did have a time period where they spit fire, and I don't know that they're dormant at all. It just happens to be in between times and periods of eruption. You know, always a risk, you know, if you live near a volcano or what have you. And in my lifetime, that's exactly what happened with one of these, namely Mount St. Helens, you know, about 100 miles, give or take 20 or 30 from my home, you know, where I grew up. And this happened back in May of 1980. And at that time period, I would have been, let me see here, six, five, five or six years old one of the two um, and I do have this memory of standing in our front yard and having an aunt of mine kind of point way off to the north it was a crystal clear day and point at this massive cloud over the horizon that actually wasn't a cloud at all it was the volcanic ash rising up into the atmosphere and being just a little kid at the time, you know, I had no idea what the ramifications of it were, or the consequences, or or any of the events leading up to it. And it would be later in school, you know, where they would teach us various things about the volcano, what had happened. I mean, Washington is basically in in our same area, if you will, so it was very relevant, you know, to a kid of that uh, time period. So, 
it, it's kind of in an area of interest and anybody, if, if you're interested in seeing a volcano blow and actually seeing footage of it, you know, this 1980, of course, is getting pretty dated, but you can find, uh, you know, there, there's a camera on everything and even back in that era, there was footage taken and if not footage, I mean, it's amazing to, to look back and think on it, but somebody happened to be there with just a regular old camera up, and as it happened had the presence of mind wherever they were and what distance they were to rapid fire take pictures in just a regular camera knowing they could string the pictures together later and make a pseudo film of it if you will kind of as it happened you know maybe the example we would take from it is kind of when we were kids and would make a cartoon and a flip book you know drawing all these little pictures and flipping the pages and seeing it happen it, it worked after a fashion but of course you know it wasn't perfect so that's what someone did with the camera uh, but there was even raw footage too and many people of course lost their their lives well I say many I mean it probably would have been worse way uh, way back um, but this happened in 1980, and I think people were a little better prepared, you know, than in, you know, say the 1800s or earlier when they would have had no warning, uh, no indication. I mean, maybe they would have seen the earthquakes and wondered what was going on, but there would have been absolutely no, uh, no people telling them to get out. You're in a dangerous place. Quite like there it was, you know, at least in 1980, and I'm sure it'd be even better uh, today. Mount St. Helens, you know, just looking up some information on it because I'd forgotten. I know there was a significant chunk of the mountain taken out. You know, the original height, it wasn't the tallest mountain. It was just under 10,000 feet um, tall. And after the eruption, it's, uh, it's approximately 8,300 feet tall. So, I mean, you think about that, I mean, that's 1,300 feet of height just ripped out of the mountain and you think about where all that dirt and rock is gonna go well I think we found out where it would go and it filled in every nook and cranny on the way down the mountain you know as it kind of thundered through the uh, uh, mud flows and everything that, that uh, took a lot of communities out you know the information I have here it said the last eruption was in 1857 I don't think I'd read that before and then it was, quote, dormant, you know, for over 100 years. 123, I think, to be exact, and then it erupted again in 1980. But what does dormant mean? You know, they, they have these things, uh, like here locally, we just received a ton of rain, and there's some flood warnings out. And I remember back in the day, you know, people saying uh, in a particular year, well, this is a 500-year flood, you know, meaning it, it won't happen again for 500 years. Well... Yeah, big whoop. I've seen those happen, you know, pretty much back to back sometimes in years, you know. So what does that mean? We're safe for a thousand? You know, sometimes I think we are so arrogant of what we, uh, what mankind thinks they know about nature, about averages and all these things that we think we can just say these things as if that's the final word and <clears throat> we don't even have a word one. But it was apparently dormant for over 100 years, and then it really blew and had a, a big one. All right, we're full up again and heading down to dump. Good thing we don't have a volcano in this here map. Now, what are you going up there for? There is absolutely <laughs> course play. I don't get you. I just don't. Anyway, I guess it'll head down over the hill. Gotta keep an eye on this honorary cuss. Anyways. So, and I do have some memory as a kid of, of when it kind of happened. I mean, it was in May when it finally blew and only the vaguest of recollection of anything leading up to it. Like I say, I was pretty young, and probably if I would have comprehended this as a kid, or been able to comprehend 
what might happen. What are you doing? What are you doing? I know, I know. Get rid of course play. Do it yourself. <laughs> Alright, we'll see if we can make it up the hill. But apparently it started in March, you know, where they started getting the harbingers of uh, an eruption or something to happen. There was uh, small eruptions happening. There was a number of earthquakes um, that gradually increased in intensity. Some eruptions of steam and ash. And I tell you what, I mean, even with a volcano, you know, when it's dormant, you kind of get lulled to sleep. You just don't expect all of a sudden, a sudden something to open up on the ground and just start spewing out steam. You know, even if we have heard of the concept of geothermal this or that, even if we know what a volcano inherently is, it still is pretty disconcerting. You know, I think if you read some of the, the headlines at the time, they talked about the volcano waking up, you know, as if it's some sleeping giant, you know, personifying this huge mound of, of rock and, and snow and ice as if it was, uh, yeah, some kind of human just ready to start doing damage. But doing damage is what it did. I mean, there was landslides, um, some ore explosive eruptions, and, and this was just, you know, harbingers of what was to come. And I guess all the scientists, or well, not all of them, but a lot of them in the area started flocking to it. They were putting their instruments on it. And, and I remember hearing something. There was this bulge kind of on the side of the mountain. And, and usually we look at a mountain and say, well, that sucker looks solid, as if nothing could move it. And it never has moved. It isn't currently moving. It is rock solid. Well, anyway, they put some devices on the side of, of uh, Mount St. Helens, and I seem to recall later, you know, as we've taken trips up there and talked to scientists, you know, that give the tours and what have you, uh, the bulge on the side of the mountain was growing literally by feet per day. I mean, can you imagine that? You see something that looks like rock, and it just keeps growing and growing every single day, pooching outward more feet, and you start to wonder what in the world is underneath that thing that is, you know, pushing with such great pressure that it would even force solid rock upward, you know, by feet per day. And, and you know, I think you hear something like that, it's like, get out of its way. And, and I know that's what the authorities tried to do. You know, there are several canyons kind of leading up to the the mountain. And what's one of them called? Was it the Tootle River? Um, anyway, there's a number of communities, logging communities, people that had their homes kind of up in the area. And so the authorities were trying to tell people to get out. And fortunately or unfortunately, as the case may be, this all happened over a fairly short period of time. And, and so the wait wasn't too long, but there was several false alarms. People wanted to, I mean, think about it, if this is your home and you want to go back to it and someone's telling you you can't go and you don't have any other place to be, that's probably pretty disconcerting, pretty, uh, make, uh, make some people pretty upset to be told, you know, they couldn't go to their, um, couldn't go to their home. So there was a lot of upset people and there's kind of a famous story with uh there was there's a lake kind of in the armpit of the mountain it was called spirit lake and there was this old codger that lived there who just happened to bear the same name as one of the former u.s presidents i think it was harry truman was his name i think he was he lived at a lodge on spirit lake and he just, he, he kind of became a media personality. And you can look up old footage of him. You know, he was kind of foul-tempered, uh, foul-mouthed, and he, he let everybody know what he thought about his mountain erupting and whether he ultimately felt it would or wouldn't, I don't even remember. The, the thing of it is, is nobody was going to tell him to get off the mountain. And ultimately, he never did come back down. He... Uh, presumably perished when uh, when the mountain blew up. And, I mean, he had to have. I mean, there's nobody that could survive uh, being up there when the whole side of the mountain comes out. But he was quite an interesting, colorful character 
kind of in the mix of it all. So, uh, around about, let's see, I think, yeah, the main eruption happened in May, on May 18th, 1980. And it just blew sky high, miles and miles into the air, and seen for miles around, and took ash and threw it all over the country, but basically. I'm trying to look here and kind of some of the materials that I have to see if it says... Oh yeah, it does kind of say it. Uh, yeah, the blast. It says yeah, devastated more than 150 square miles north of the mountain. That's just laying flat the area kind of around the the mountain. But then the ash cloud said reached as high as 70,000 feet, and is definitely miles into the atmosphere, and was literally tracked around the world. It probably even ultimately impacted the climate in, in some fashion. It always seems like volcanic eruptions do. And as the case may be, you know, at our home, we are south of the mountain. We actually got a little tiny bit of ash that fell near our home. But there were some other areas that were inundated with it. You know, the wind patterns at the time happened to be carrying it a little north and east and there were places it just came down as if it was snow and just blanketed the area ruined cars ruined everything you know that it just fell on and got into everything it must have been a horrible mess you know to try to pick up you know so there's several cities here that it mentions how many inches of uh, of Asheville um, let me see here Spokane Washington that's 255 miles away they got some it just carried it, it uh, all over. And then in the years since, it has actually erupted a couple more times, but these are much smaller. And what the scientists say is it's rebuilding the dome, the top of the mountain. You know, they say this is very typical of this kind of uh, volcano. It blows up and then starts rebuilding more lava pushes out and more rock and it just slowly rebuilds the cone kind of in in the crater and the mountain on the top is blown off you can drive up there not clear to the top of course but it kind of blew sideways too blew, blew to the north and so they have several visitor centers up there now you can observe the mountain and kind of look into it from the north and sure enough, you can see there's another cone, or is it is cone the word? Another, another little mountain within a mountain, if you will. It's slowly building up, and you know who knows how long it'll take, if if ever, you know that it'll be the original size of the mountain. Um, but it's just it's fascinating to be able to see this happen in in your history and experience it a little bit and. Periodically, over time, uh, with last, um, I think a year, almost a year ago, being the most recent time, periodically, our family's gone up there. It's very interesting to go there, and there's at least three visitor centers, uh, although I think this particular trip, we went into a fourth one that I hadn't been to before, each with kind of a little bit different angle on it. Many of them will show films, you can see the eruption, they will have these 3D models that show kind of the topography of the area and what happened. Loads of pictures, samples of ash and pumice and all of these things, you know, that accompany a, a volcanic eruption like it. And, and also loads of pontificating on how it happened, when it'll happen again, if ever, and so forth and so on. Like I say, the sometimes I guess I pass that off as arrogance of the human being we, we think we uh, are more in control than, uh, than what we really are although in this case here I would say the counsel of the authorities to get out of the air because something bad was about to happen was spot on you know some <laughs> I would hasten to say that too sometimes we say the government doesn't know anything and when things really hit the fan it's every man for himself but in this case here, they did try to warn the people and, and get them out of there. They didn't know what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, uh, but it did happen fairly soon and, and the devastation was, was great. 
so this last year um, we we went up there as part of a church trip and did some hiking visited uh, we were gonna go to a visitor center but uh, as it turns out like the week or two before we got up there there just happened to be a mudslide that took it out a section of the road you know so I do feel fortunate that we weren't up there when that happened you know I, I learned later there were several people that were clear up at the top and they had their cars parked up there and those people weren't going to get their cars out of the air for a long time until they had repaired the road which I think they said was possibly even going to take a year because it's one of those areas you know whenever you go up in the mountains and you know maybe we don't think anything of it when we're driving on a road that is carved into a mountain and again it looks like solid rock but if don't go down my goodness can't you see <laughs> You know, we take for granted the work that it took to put that road there, and we take for granted that it's as solid as it appears. And I'll tell you, one bad weather event, one massive mudslide, one whatever, and all of a sudden the road that you thought was solid is taken out and just obliterated. And, you know, to try to fill that in or to make it solid again, I mean, can require just a boatload of work. So. But fortunately, it happened before we got the air, and unfortunately, and we couldn't go visit the visitor center clear at the top, um, so we went kind of on a hike uh, lower. I was just looking at some some data here. I think it ended up killing 36 people, and I remember seeing footage of this. You know, and these were people. A lot of them just may not have even known what kind of danger they were in or even that they should get out of the air may have felt they were a safe distance away they were just camping or doing whatever out in the brush with their families some people made it out and others weren't so fortunate but i think there were 36 people ultimately killed that they accounted for um, a number of missing people. I guess you can probably presume that they have also they also were fatalities. You know, if they were still missing to this day. Uh, but when the thing blew, like I say, a lot of the force went sideways. And one of the things you notice as you travel up there is a bunch of toothpicks. I mean, a lot of the trees they allowed some salvage logging to come in and reclaim some of the timber that was destroyed but a lot of it they just left alone so the scientists could observe how nature heals itself you know when, when something like this happens and one of the things you notice is just these tree after tree after tree the whole hillside of trees just blown down like toothpicks by the force of this blast and we're not talking the force of a blast of, uh, uh, or the, the flow of mud hitting these things or anything. It is sheerly the shock wave of the mountain blowing its top off, or in this case, off the side. It just laid the forest flat in the direction that the, uh, that the blast happened. And it's just kind of interesting to see that. You know, it's like as if unseen hands you know, knocked all these trees down and then just kind of lined them all up in a row, all nice and neat and tidy. And it's like, <laughs> that isn't what happened at all. You know, it's the blast that did it. And it's interesting, too, to see how the topography impacted the blast. You look at all those trees and sometimes here and there, there would be pockets, you know, where in the nook of, a, of the side of a hill, the blast didn't reach or it went over the top and so you'll see a few stands of trees here and there that somehow escaped damage while neighboring trees around it you know were just flat and the blast is one thing I think I mentioned earlier I, I think it's still called the largest landslide in history was when the side of the mountain fell down under the force of the blast you know and we talked about 1300 feet of, of mountain height that just crumbled and went down and it had to go somewhere. Gravity and the blast took it down into the valleys and the mud. The mud happened because of all the heat. You know, you think about a mountain up there, they generally have a solid glacier 
and all of a sudden you put a whole bunch of volcanic heat on that and steam and the uh, I don't know how quick it went but basically the glacier was vaporized turned into liquid and you got all that water and snow melt coming down on top of all that uh, landslide that just happened and now you have an enormous quantity of mud boulders and other material and just gravity taking all that downstream and you know 1980 was some time ago the footage you can look up on it is a crisp and neat like today might be if you would see it but um, you can look it up on YouTube and and see I think it's a Toodle River Canyon you'll see all the ad stuff coming down and just carving out new valleys new uh, streams and filling up others you know solid with mud and, and all this destructive activity ripping homes off their foundation if they were in the way you know I think there's some footage of, of hauling homes down the river they get stuck under bridges and the water and mud and everything just grinds the houses out and destroys them utterly and so just all of this these horrible things that uh, that you just don't see every day you know and when you live in the shadow of a volcano these are some of the things you know that uh, that can happen with with it and it also begs some questions you know this was a hundred miles from home and you know, I've had some thoughts like, well, what would happen if Mount Hood, which is much closer, what would we do if it blew up? You know, we're still some distance from it. I don't know what kind of damage we'd have, but somebody sure would. We unfortunately don't live uh, right up by the mountain or within its uh, valleys or river outflows, but I'm sure there would be some damage. And you look further up into Washington, you see the huge city of Seattle, where it is kind of just off the water, and it's kind of pinched in there between, you know, pretty narrow space. Uh, Seattle, Olympia, and all these, these towns in there. And right due east of them, looming even larger, is um, Mount Rainier. And Mount Rainier is also a volcano. And people are postulating, you know, well, when might it blow? And nobody knows, of course. But it is uh, one of the, those things to consider. You know, I know probably all of us have heard the story or read about it in school of, of Pompeii way back in the day, and how all of the destructive destruction that happened preserved many things in that town. People just going about their day-to-day -day animals, whatever, and all of a sudden the horror of a volcanic eruption is on them and it's disruptive at the least and horribly destructive to people with property at, at the worst so anyway i don't know what made me want to talk about the ad uh, this evening but it was something <laughs> something that came to mind so the bell is already run i hope you all are having a wonderful day wherever you're at and I will leave you at this moment and see you on the next one. Goodbye for now.